For the next couple of hours, this is a symposium called Hard Stories. And we will be discussing exactly that, Hard Stories. We will be looking back on 20 years of DART Award winners and 20 years of DART Award judging, trying to draw out some lessons, really get under the hood of some of the richest, most powerful reporting of the last couple of decades um, and think about how it works and what it means for reporters going forward. Uh, we'll have two panels. One is, of, uh, is up here now, DART Award winners, a second panel of DART Award judges. That will take us until about 5.30, at which time we will revert to reception mode uh, and ceremony mode and hear from Steve Call, the Dean of the Journalism School, uh, James Lammers of the DART, representing the DART family, uh, and then move into our award ceremony and panel with the 2014 winners. So we'll begin now by looking back and then end this evening on a celebration of this year's extraordinary DART award winning work. Um, I just want to say before the panel begins, by way of context, a little bit about the DART Award and how it has evolved since 1994. Um, there are people in this room who've been involved with it for a long time. I was a speaker at the second DART Award in 1995. Joe Height over there was the winner of the third DART Award. So, and, and there's uh, up, up to Habib Noshin who received it this year, last year rather. There's a lot of history here. And um, we we're going to go into that a little bit. The DART Award began at Michigan State University. It was uh, an initiative that began with conversations between a, a psychiatrist and great friend of the DART Center and of journalists, Frank Ockberg, who couldn't be here today and sends his regrets. Um, and Michigan State, where Frank taught both in journalism and in forensic psychiatry, uh, and the DART Foundation, a family charity from uh, the folks uh, from the company that makes uh, styrofoam packaging uh, that wanted to do some good in the world. And, and Frank looked around and realized that as journalists, we spend a lot of time telling stories about people who've had the worst things happen to them. Uh, Lots of crime, lots of war, lots of disaster. And that's fine. But an awful lot of it was riddled with cliche. An awful lot of it uh, is inadequate. An awful lot of it reflected no understanding of the new science of trauma. So in, in 1994, the DART Foundation agreed to fund this prize that at first was called the DART Award for, uh, uh, for Excellence in Reporting on Victims of Violence. Uh, and it was, as with so many things, we thought a very simple idea. The simple idea is a big prize worth multiple thousands of dollars that might have the, the weight and dignity of, of the Pulitzer, which is announced every year in this room, uh, and which some people on this panel have won as recently as this year, Joe. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, that would recognize exceptional work that portrays victims or survivors of violence neither as pathetic, powerless victims nor as saccharine cliches, but as they really are. People on a journey, people capable of recovery, uh, people with dignity and guts and determination. Uh, the DART Award, uh, at first it was for a single newspaper story, and in that first year, 1994, went to uh, a newspaper from Alaska for a wonderful story about uh, a group of women, all of whom had been victims of sexual abuse and all of whom confronted their abusers and were a sort of support group for one another. Uh, the second year, uh, when I first began working um, in collaboration with these folks, it was for a great story from the Austin American Statesman about a a man whom I still remember, Emmett Jackson, who had lost his wife and child in an arson fire uh, in which he was burned over three quarters of his body. And 
a great reporter and photographer, uh, Lynn Dobson and Michelle Stanish, followed Mr. Jackson for a year through his recovery, wrote about it in the Austin American Statesman. The third year was for uh, the Oklahoman and its coverage of the Oklahoma City bombing, one of the great feats of compassionate and innovative breaking news reporting in, uh, that still sets a standard uh, in the last generation. And on and on and on. Um, at first, as I said, the DART award was simply for newspaper coverage. In 1994, 95, 96, of course, newspapers, daily newspapers, were still the dominant news source along with uh, the evening news in this country. Gradually, the award itself changed. First of all, it became the award for coverage of trauma. We gradually came to realize that um, a singular focus on victims of violence doesn't necessarily do justice to the breadth of issues of science, of politics and policy. So the criteria was broadened a little bit and gradually investigative stories and others began to sometimes win. We realized there was an awful lot of good journalism out there. Uh, first at Michigan State, then at the University of Washington where the DART Center was established in 1999 before coming here to Columbia in 2009. And so gradually we added a broadcast award uh, a radio award um, alongside the newspaper award. So, so as journalism changed, the, the, the award was changed by the technology. Finally, actually in that, uh, in that department, a couple of years ago, Kate Black, who directs the DART Award and is sitting over there, um, and I were talking and realized that there was no point anymore in even trying to do these genres because television stations and radio stations were putting up great written word reporting on their websites. Daily newspapers were producing multimedia. It was a completely futile exercise. So we led, among the big national prizes, we led in blowing up the categories, which now most of the major prizes have done. And now the DART Award is open to North American uh, journalism in all media. And we simply are trying to compare the best with the best with the best. Um, so the award has changed because of journalism. Most of all, though, it's changed because I think that the DART Award winners themselves have been innovators, striking out new pathways, new ways of researching stories about trauma, new ways of incorporating trauma science, new ways of incorporating the voices of victims and witnesses and survivors, new ways of narrative, of creating narrative. There's no obvious model in journalism for reaching deep into the grief of a family that lost a child in the Oklahoma City bombing or in Hurricane Katrina. There is no obvious language for the life of a child who looks back over 30 years and learns that his parents were massacred, as Habiba Noshin uh, reported on for This American Life a couple of years ago. These all require new storytelling techniques and research techniques and ways of engaging audiences. And it is the DART Award winners themselves who have pioneered that, and in each of these winners has changed journalism. So as we go through these discussions today, what we're really going to be looking at are these little sort of flashes of light on the cave wall of journalism illuminating moments, stories, incidents, events, that the journalistic vocabulary has been rich, enriched, that public consciousness has been changed, that the voices of victims and the stories of aftermath have been elevated above exploitation, above sensation, and into a kind of in-depth conversation that I think really has changed public awareness of some very important issues. Um, this will be a conversation. We'll have time for a Q&A. We are also, however, going to be sticking very strictly to schedule. Um, there is a kind of half-hour block starting at 5.30 when we have this reception and some announcements and ceremonial business and because of the schedules of the people who have to be there, it's got to be them. So though it's not fair to our huge panel, number of panelists, 
we're going to try to keep things focused and move along and get quick sketches of thoughts from each of you and each in the following panel as well. And I get to be the, the time cop and tell people to shut up and move on. So um, we will have time for conversation. If you're in the back and you feel like moving front, please do so. If you feel like grabbing coffee and snacks, please do so. We're going to begin now and, and just barrel through for the next couple of hours. Um, I think I'll just move over here to kick off this, this panel, and then we'll uh, see what we do. Um, all right. So are we here? Yes. Can everyone hear me? And can the video hear me? A uh, quick parenthesis, by the way, this is going to be uh, um, streamed eventually on the Dart Center website. In the interests of time, I'm not going to be reading detailed biographies of people, but they are on the back table. Um, and you can and should read them. This is a powerhouse group. Um, on this panel, let me just quickly run through who's here, and then we'll begin. Uh, and I think this is more or less in order. Uh, well, sort of. Uh, <laughs> on the far right, uh, Joe Hyde, who is editor of the Colorado uh, Springs Gazette, winner of this year's Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting, uh, and the 1996 Dart Award winner for coverage of the Oklahoma City bombings. I'm going to break my own rule and do a little bit of biography here because Joe actually brackets uh, the whole history of the Dart Awards in a very important way. Uh, as I said, he was managing editor of the Oklahoma and he led the paper's coverage of the the bombing's aftermath, then later was part of the conversations, a critical part of the conversations that created the DART Center in 1999. Uh, he was uh, eventually president of the DART Center's executive committee and helped guide uh, eventually our move from the University of Washington to here at Columbia. He's also been a DART Awards judge, contributed his insight to that. Uh, and finally, now as editor of, uh, the, of the Colorado Springs Gazette, he has come full circle. Uh, one of the stories, or the investigative series, uh, other than honorable, about veterans with other than honorable discharges, which he supervised by uh, Dart Center Ockburn Fellow Dave Phillips, one of his reporters, was a finalist for this year's uh, Dart Awards. So Joe is here wearing multiple hats, and I'm, I'm sure He'll reflect that. Uh, we have Rob Perez of the Honolulu Star Advertiser, uh, who uh, won the 2009 Dart Award for Crossing the Line, Abuse in Hawaii Homes. Great series on uh, intimate partner violence. Uh, Laura Sullivan, investigative correspondent of NPR, who won the 2008 Dart Award uh, for Sexual Abuse of Native American Women one of the great feats of in-depth radio of the last decade, in my humble opinion, and also the 2012 Dart Award Honorable Mention for another great series on native foster care, lost children, uh, shattered families. Jeb Sharp, uh, reporter for PRI's The World, 2009 Dart Award winner for Rape as a Weapon of War, and uh, Laura S oh, Pesler, Pesler, sorry, <laughs> Habiba Noshin, uh, alum of this school, uh, for better or worse. Uh, <laughs> investigative journalist and documentary filmmaker for Frontline and Elsewhere, and the 2009 winner, uh, 2013 winner rather, last year, for What Happened at Dos Eras, uh, a This American Life episode concerning a massacre three decades ago in Guatemala, and one of the few survivors of that event. Another one of the sort of towering radio achievements of recent years. Uh, that's our panel. And I'm, I'm going to begin by asking each of you, starting with Joe, to maybe think a little bit about the work and talk a little bit about the work you did, the project you did that won the DART Award, and maybe think about one thing that you encountered or learned in the course of that work that stretched your capacities and knowledge as a journalist, and that, that changed your practice, that changed what you do and how you do it. 
And maybe the, anything you see that's changed more broadly in your own work or in journalism in general coming out of these stories that you've done. But really thinking about your, your DART Award work, what went into it and what, what it changed for you as a result. Joe, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Bruce. And uh, first, most importantly, a hearty congratulations to the Las Vegas Sun uh, for winning the DART Award this year. Uh, just outstanding work and an extremely tough award to win, so congratulations. Uh, secondly, I, I want to say that I did not bring samples of a certain substance that's now legal in Colorado for everyone, <laughs> so I just want to be up front with everyone. That, uh, that certain story has consumed uh, my newspaper, although I have not consumed that certain substance. I want to say that, too. Um, I, I want to take you back to uh, 1995 and, uh, and what happened on that April 19th day and uh, how it affected me deeply as well as a whole newsroom. Um, 168 people died in that bombing of the federal building in downtown Oklahoma City. Uh, there's still a debate today whether there were more people who were just basically disintegrated by the bomb, um, as well as the debate about the conspiracy uh, that seemingly did or did not exist. But I'm not going to get into the conspiracy. I, I'm going to get into uh, what happened in the newsroom that day. And um, I was designated as what you call the victim's team leader of the coverage of all the people who died and all the people who were injured. And, um, and, and three straight months of page one coverage uh, uh, about uh, an event that, that changed our thoughts on domestic terrorism uh, over time. And, and we instituted the first ever uh, vignettes on victims of every victim who died. Um, we started uh, the thought that you needed to think about your community, uh, how to help the victims, how to get help. What are those stories that are so important uh, that need to be told about people helping uh, in the community? Um, so I'm going to talk about this today, but I'm also going to talk to you about a journey I had as well uh, after the Oklahoman won the award. I want to take you first to a scene about a year later. And it's just basically an office uh, in the 12-story tower north of Oklahoma City. Uh, basically a, a, a tower that houses the Oklahoman and was basically shaken uh, by the bomb blast that sp as it spread north out of downtown Oklahoma City uh, and that massive gray uh, cloud of smoke that rose into the sky. Uh, a year later, we were sitting at a computer in an office looking uh, to see the Pulitzer Awards. And we were seeing maybe, maybe they would be considered. And you know, the Pulitzer Awards are the big secret. Uh, you know, until you open up that computer, you really don't know. Uh, and so the, we had kind of gathered, we thought maybe, perhaps, that uh, that coverage, which was so extensive, over time would win a Pulitzer Award. Um, but I can tell you, there was utter disappointment that day uh, that it did not win, that an image was chosen instead to represent the Oklahoma City bombing. And yeah, we were disappointed. But then a couple of weeks later, two or three weeks later, I got a call from Michigan State University uh, basically saying you'd won the DART Award for Journalism and Trauma. And and I thought, how significant is that? How significant that is to, to everyone uh, that worked on this uh, particular story? And that time, at that time, the editor was Ed Kelly, and, and he said something that I still hold dear today. He said, this will be the most important award we won this year. We won two SPJ awards, national awards, as well as other awards. But he said the DART Award for journalism, Prama will be the most important award we won based on this coverage. It'll be one you'll cherish for years. And for me, that became the case because we took that $10,000, and I'm not expecting the winner this year to take your $10,000 or whatever the it's, prize it's is. It's not $10,000 anymore. Yeah. What, is it? what is it, Bruce? <laughs> One no. of the ways the award has changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Okay. No, but, okay. no we took the actual prize <laughs> and uh, we turned it into a workshop on coverage of victims uh, for the whole state. Uh, and then from there, I started a relationship with Frank Ockberg and others, and which started me a journey uh, that took me to Ireland, London, Tasmania, Australia, uh, to about every state uh, in this country to talk about this type of coverage. And there's so many stories that came from it. Uh, Bruce and I went to New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and actually had to tour the, the almost apparently bombed out areas that, of what happened during that uh, particular event. But what struck to me is the meeting we had with the uh, Times-Picune staff and the story that this one journalist told to her boss, basically she said, I can't do this anymore. Every night I go home, I have to drink a bottle of vodka so I can clean up my house while covering this story and all the victims and tragedy connected to it. Then there's the story of the mother who clung to her 10-year-old child as if it were her own, her own, as I spoke in Hobart, Tasmania. She had lost her teenage daughter and niece in a mass shooting in the cafeteria at Port Arthur, uh, the Port Arthur Massacre uh, that it's known. Uh, which is the historical side on the Australian island. Um, then there's the young police beat reporters who ask whether it was okay for them to be paranoid about their own safety and their family's safety after I spoke at the Pointer Institute. In short, I said, sure, I am, still am today, based on what we do. Then there was the Amish couple who spoke of forgiveness of the killer and his family after the massacre of the one-room schoolhouse in West Nichols Mine, Pennsylvania, and how that really changed my thought about what forgiveness is really all about, and how the Amish thought toward those, that killer who had killed five young girls in that schoolhouse that was torn down, I guess, the next night by the Amish so they could move on. The journey was also one of rediscovery and revelation to me. Um, one, I struggle to remember anything from 1995 beyond the bombing. Uh, and those memories have come back over time, but it was, it was kind of remarkable to me. How could I forget the second year of my daughter's life, my youngest daughter's life? How could I forget that? It'd be one I which I would remember haunting images of that shelled out building the scarred face of a man who came into the Oklahoman and then was injured in the bombing. The request of a reporter who told me she couldn't go on for all, everything that was happening. The realization the story would follow me the rest of my life. How I needed to defend my st home state of Oklahoma early on after having a nightmares of explosions and tragedy before I spoke to audience. Um, the one I remember most is, is the story of Dana Cooper, her reddish curly hair, uh, a smile that was incredible for a 24-year-old. Uh, I tell it often, and I keep telling it because it means so much to me because of a phone call that I made. Uh, she was in her senior year at the University of Central Oklahoma, majoring in early child development, and three weeks into her job as America's Kids Daycare Director in the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building. Uh, she had taken her son, two-year-old son Christopher to her to work. She thought she was pretty, pretty lucky to have her uh, son in that daycare with her. Um, and that afternoon, she, on April 19th, she was going to a daycare conference in um, San Francisco. Um, the, the sentences, life seemed so full of hope for Dana Cooper the 902 came are ones that I use often. But the call I made a week after the bombing in that shell of a building uh, still haunts me and would haunt anyone. I called the number just out of a hunch and got this recording. Hi, you've reached America Kids Child Development Center. My name is Dana Cooper, and I'm sorry I can't come to the phone right now. I'm probably with the children or touring the facility. 
if this is concerning child care rates, employment opportunities, or you're just checking in on your child, please include that in your message, and I'd be happy to call you back. Thanks. At the end of the message, the recording says, the answering machine's mailbox was full. And I still think of how all those parents trying to call their children, call on their children to check on them, and how 19 of them did not come home. This journey also revealed to me the meaning behind why journalists cover tragedies the way they do, and how we could do better. It also revealed to me the reaction of communities to these disasters, ones I still to use today. And this is what I really want to emphasize, how communities react to these disasters and these tragedies. I was researching uh, for a handbook, um, uh, the Tragedies in Journalists book, booklet. And I asked Meg Spratt at the University of Washington if we had anything on how people react, how communities react. She found one hard copy of a study called Disasters in Mental Health Selected Contemporary Perspectives from the Center for Mental Health Studies of Emergencies. It was intended for clinicians and researchers, but I found journalists really need to know this too. It talked about the trauma membrane. It said the survivor network seems to develop a boundary of its own that has special permittability properties. While these properties include an early permittability to anyone who seems willing to help, this boundary later, later becomes tightly see, sealed, and outsiders are allowed in only under certain circumstances and for certain functions. One of the functions of the survivor network boundary is to safeguard the more traumatized member from harm. Another is to provide psychic healing. Survivor networks encourage empathy for the absurd and communality in suffering, mourning, and restoration. On the other hand, negative community characteristics may promote intrusiveness, disavow, and defenses <coughs> against helplessness, suspiciousness, guilt, shame, and isolation. In short, many of the secondary characteristics of post-traumatic stress disorder. Last April, at about the same time we were nearing the publishing of probably the most difficult project, not the most difficult coverage, but the most difficult project I had ever been involved with called Other Than Honorable. The story of how the Army was kicking out soldiers with PTSD and traumatic brain injuries at an alarming rate. A subject that I understood well due to my association with the DART Center founder, Dr. Frank Ockberg, who became a most trusted counselor over the years and the center itself. As all of this was occurring, we received a call from Colorado Springs public officials who wanted to discuss coverage of a report of the Waldo Canyon wildfire, one of two straight years of wildfires that affected my community and my newspaper, the Gazette in Colorado Springs. The report, as many are, were critical of some of the handling of that particular wildfire and reported it line by line, all later proven to be accurate. When we arrived, the room was full, nearly full of officials who immediately went into an emotional tirade about our coverage. One official called the Gazette a piece of crap. Another became emotional as he talked about how, how the fire came so close to his home. Another glared at us as if we were behind the wildfire. I didn't react. My training and work with the DART Center has taught me never to react to emotional outbursts. I understood that they had been deeply affected. I remembered that trauma membrane study. Journalists face constant difficulties in what we cover and how we cover it and our community's reaction to it. You're going to hear some amazing stories from my fellow panelists as well as from the Las Vegas Sun. But I want to take you back to this April. 20 years after the first DART Award, and 19 years after the Oklahoma City bombing, I sat in my office looking at a computer screen. Nearby sat managing editor Joanna Bean. Other than honorable reporter Dave Phillips was flying back from an awards program in Washington. When I was looking at it, I remembered the utter disappointment in 1996 as I looked at that screen. This time, the flash of the computer screen was different announced that a small to medium-sized newspaper, the smallest organization in the country, had won the Pulitzer Prize. In the midst of jubilation and planning, 
for stories about the prize, I pause in my office and reminisce that disappointment of so many years ago and how and how a few weeks later an award came my way that changed the Oklahoman and changed my life and how that award still is here today. It started a journey that has changed my life and changed the lives of so many journalists in this country and this world. And I can say all for the better. Well, I then wiped you. a tear from my eyes and went out in the newsroom to make an announcement. Thank well, you. Well, thank you, Joe. That was great. Um, let's go on. I mean, Rob, you're there. And let me just say, Joe gets a certain <coughs> amount of air because of seniority <laughs> and experience. I'll stick to the Try time. Try to keep it focused and narrow <laughs> just because you want to have time for conversation. <laughs> thank you. Anyway, Bruce, you posed the question of how our DART work had pushed the envelope of our reporting techniques, and that, interestingly, is precisely what I was uh, going to talk about today. Writing about intimate partner violence in a place like Hawaii s poses some special challenges, and I quickly learned what they were when I started reporting for our series. In addition to the more common factors such as stigma and shame that contribute to the hidden nature of this problem, Hawaii's size, remoteness, and cultural diversity added to those challenges. In the first half of 2008, Hawaii had a handful of domestic violence killings in a relatively short period of time. Four were murder-suicides. The cases prompted a lot of public discussion about the state's overall domestic violence problem, and the newspaper sought to answer one of the main questions being asked, why were we, as a community, failing Hawaii's abused women. What resulted from our investigation was a series that anchored our front page for seven consecutive days. We also published a four-page special section each day devoted to just one case, a 21-year-old woman who was fatally shot in the head by her estranged boyfriend while their two-year-old son watched. Her story was especially compelling because she kept the journal until shortly before she died. We quoted from it extensively. When I started the reporting, it became very clear that we were going to have difficulty getting victims to talk on the record. Hawaii is a relatively small state, and with the population dispersed over several main islands, it seems even smaller. If someone wants to find you, they probably can. You can't hop in a car and drive to the next county or the next state to seek safe refuge. Not surprisingly then, the fear of retaliation from both the abuser and the abuser's family was one of the major concerns of the victims. Many considered Hawaii's criminal justice system broken, offering little protection to them and little accountability to their abusers. One of the first victims I talked to was an Oahu woman who, since her divorce, had moved five times precisely to try and keep her location secret from her ex-husband. But each time, her former spouse was able to track her down and make contact despite a 35-year protection order that was in place. On one occasion when she was remarried, her ex sent her a gift card from a, a steakhouse. And on the card, he had drawn um, two red targets over the two cattle that were on the card. Um, she filed repeated complaints to the police, but uh, the man was never prosecuted for violating the protective order. When another woman sought a protective order, she told the judge that her estranged boy boyfriend was constantly stalking her, even to the point of spending the night outside her apartment, just wanting to keep tabs of her comings and goings. The, dr the judge granted the order, but less than two months later, she was found dead shot in the head by her stalker. When abused women in Hawaii hear stories like these, they realize the risk of going public is very real. 
And in a place with such a diverse ethnic makeup, multiple cultural factors add to that mix, particularly the powerful notion of keeping family matters in the family. The cultural barriers I found were largely insurmountable, especially with first and second generation immigrants or those who clearly adhere to their traditional values. Yet the majority of the other victims I spoke to eventually agreed to talk to me on the record. That came mostly through earning their trust. I met with some of them three, four, and five times before they agreed to speak for attribution. Many had never dealt with the reporters before, so I had to make sure they understood precisely how I planned to tell their stories, and if they allowed us to fo photograph them, how we intended to use their images on, in our layouts. If their photo was gonna go on A1 as the lead art, they had to know. Then, I read to them exactly what I had written about their cases, being sure to give them enough details to understand the context. I also told them, and this seemed to be especially reassuring to some of them, about the number of other victims I would be quoting by name in that story. In addition, I did something that I had never done in my 30 years in this business. I gave each victim the power to pull their names from the story if they felt uncomfortable for any reason about being identified. At first, I was a little uneasy about making that kind of offer. I thought it might cross an ethical line giving too much control, but not editing power, to a figure in the story. But the more I talked to these victims, the more I realized it was the right thing to do. By the end of the process, I was fairly certain that no one who spoke to me on the record would pull out. No one did. But giving these women control over their own stories seemed to be critically important. It really seemed to cement the bond of trust between us. And when you're writing about intimate partner violence in such a small community, the importance of gaining that trust can't be overstated. And, and I think we'll find that, that this question of trust and choice and power is a common theme to emerge from many of the Peace Art Award winners. So let's, we can come back to it in conversation. Let me move to Laura. Just then, we've been joined by Ben Montgomery, who will uh, also chime in eventually. Uh, he's just <laughs> off the plane. We'll let him get over his jet lag. And, uh, <laughs> Laura, you won the 2008 award for your, your Sexual Abuse of Native American Women series. You must have faced some of the same kinds of choices and challenges. and. <coughs> Um, in a different way. You know, when I my biggest problem and my biggest hurdle with this story was that uh, I had ne I didn't know anything about Native American reservations and I didn't know anything about Native Americans and and I remember I I read a I read the statistic in this Justice Department report that said one in three Native American women will be sexually assaulted or raped in her lifetime and I was like that can't be right that's absurd that's ridiculous that can't be happening. And uh, checked it back, looked at it, it was absolutely true. And I thought, well, why don't, well I'm just going to go do a story about this. I'm just going to, you know, go to a reservation and we'll just, we'll just do a story about that happening. And um, I had a friend who covered uh, a Native American, a group of Native American tribes in, in Nevada. And she had, I remember her saying once that, it was really hard to cover Native American tribes, that it was hard to gain trust, that all this stuff. And I thought, well, okay, that's that's probably true, but you know, I'm in DC and and when you want to do an interview, you just call people up on the phone and you call the person in charge and you set up an interview and then you go to their office and you sit down and you do the interview and and then you file, file your story. So, I thought, well, I'm just going to call the head of the Standing Rock Sioux in South Dakota and um, I'm just going to set up an interview with the chairman of the tribe. So I mean, so I called him and, and I got him on the phone and he was perfectly, I mean, he was perfectly lovely man and I said, I'm doing this story about the rape of Native American women and, and the high rate of it and why that's happening and 
can I come out and interview you and, and talk to some other people in your tribe about that? And he said, yeah, I know, that, that sounds fine. And I was like, okay, well, can I, you know, how about, can I come next week or the week after? And he's like, yeah, no, that sounds fine. And I said, okay, great, so I'm gonna come and I'll be there maybe about two o'clock, sounds fine. And I said, great, so I hung up the phone and I was like, how hard is that? That's, what, that's great, this is all working out really great. I told my editor, I really don't think we have any problems here, I'm just gonna go out, I'm gonna do the story, I'm gonna come back, it'll be fine. So I went out to Standing Rock with uh, NPR's producer, Amy Walters. And it's a long way from any airport, really. You drive a long time. We finally showed up. We found our way. I mean, this is, you know, we found our way out to where the tribal headquarters was, where chairman of Standing Rock's office was. And, and we went in, and we, we stopped by the desk, and they showed us to the office, and we found his secretary. And I was like, I'm Laura Sullivan. This is Amy Walters. We're from NPR, and we have an interview. Uh, we're here to meet with um, Chairman um, his, his uh, Horses Thunder. And she was like, okay, well, you can have a seat. So we sat down and we waited. And then we waited some more. And then sometime about an hour later, I was like, do you think he's just, I mean, we don't, there's nobody. We haven't seen anybody in this whole building. And I was like, do you think he's just really busy? I mean, maybe he's got somebody in there. I don't know. And so she was like, I don't know either. So after like 20 more minutes, I kind of went back up to her and I was like, yeah, do you think that the chairman is, is really busy right now? I mean, is he on the phone? I mean, do you think that we're going to get to see him anytime soon? And she looks at me and she goes, oh, he's not here. <laughs> and I said, what? Well, but we had this interview, we were gonna, t she's like, I, and I said, do you know where he is? And she's like, Louisa, do you know where the chairman is? And she's like, yeah, he's out at his, uh, the ranch house. And I was like, where's that? And she's like, you'll never find it. It's hours from here. It's like four hours away. It's down a dirt road. It's unmarked. He built it himself. You're never going to find it. And I was like, well, can we call him? She's like, no, that's just really not a good idea. <laughs> so I was like, OK, wow, we're kind of screwed. So not only have we, we don't know anybody else. We don't know what we're going to do. That was my plan. That was my big plan to do this story. And so what we ended up doing is we drove over to a women's shelter, which I knew about, and, and uh, um, we got there, and, and we sort of introduced ourselves to a wonderful woman who runs this women's shelter. And um, I think she saw the desperation on our faces, and she was like, why don't you come in and sit down for a little while and uh, talk for a bit. And that, I think, in her women's shelter was when I first started realizing that it was going to be harder than we expected to do this story, and that it was going to take a different kind of work, you know, and that work was going to be that we had to be there and be present and show up and do the time. And uh, we spent, I'm not kidding you, I think NPR paid me for like three days to sit on this woman's couch and eat Cheetos. I mean, that's what we did. And we just hung out. I called my editor and I was like, um, this is going to take a little longer than we thought it was going to take. <laughs> In fact, I think we might have to come back <laughs> another time. So we, um, we started, you know, I have this rule about being a reporter that it's like the three-day rule. Like, you're, you're screwed for the first two and a half days, but halfway through the third day, you start getting somewhere. So, um, can I we're, you on that? Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's the two and a half to three-day rule. And so, uh, finally, you know, I, we started getting the scope of the situation because, you know, she started trusting us. She started introducing us to other people. And these are some of the things that, that I learned from the very beginning is that, one, we were complete outsiders. Nobody wanted to talk to us. Nobody trusted us. I mean, we were just... You know, we were just nothing that anybody there could relate to in any way. This is one of the poorest places in the United States. Um, people coming from the outside are usually bringing bad news. So for us to walk in there and think that people were just going to start talking about horrific, traumatic experiences was ridiculous. Also, that it is very hard to reach people because people are very poor and they don't have phones. So when you're trying to, I remember saying to the woman who runs the shelter, she's like, you know, 
because we told her all about our story. We told her all about our problems trying to reach the chairman, and she laughed. She's like, that? Yeah. And then she said, we'll talk about that a little later. And then she started saying, you know, why don't you talk to this one woman? So we would go, and we would talk to the woman. She's like, and ask her if maybe she thinks it's a good idea for you to talk to this other woman. And then you can, and it was like, do it like this. And then I was like, well, can we just call her and see if we can come over? And she was like, no. And I said, why? And she said, well, because nobody has phones. And when you do have phones, it's the end of the month. So everybody's minutes are used up. So you can't call them anyway. Additionally, we started realizing that I was like, well, can we, okay, okay, can we drive over to the person's house? Can you, can we, you come with us and introduce us to this person? And she's like, no, that's not a good idea because she doesn't have electricity right now and she's really embarrassed about it. Okay, so can we drive over there and have you, can we bring her, I mean, it's like this whole other level of, of, of just the logistics of getting to the people, let alone like getting them to trust you. But we found that once you got one person to trust you, other people would trust you too. And the, the heart of our story, I remember at one point, uh, was this idea, because for me, when you're doing these traumatic, horrible, sad stories of horrible things happening to people, you can often run into sympathy fatigue with your audience. You know, where it's just, no, not another sad story. You know, not another thing that's horrible in the world that I now have to take into my day at work. Um, but if you can turn that story from the sad story into why, mm -hmm. who is responsible for this happening? Yes, the men who are, are raping the women are responsible or the sexual assaults that are happening there are people responsible. But why is that happening at such a level that nobody's paying attention to it? And what we found is simply that the Justice Department and the federal government, because of a 200 years of just quagmire ridiculous laws, um, are the only people that had any authority on Indian reservations. And they weren't prosecuting the cases uh, because these are small, tiny rape cases in the middle of nowhere. And they're responsible for huge terrorism cases and all this other stuff. And also that the Bureau of Indian Affairs was understaffed, undermanned, had no resources for this, and couldn't handle it. So a lot of these cases, even though the women were reporting them, nothing was happening. And the woman that we ended up finding, you know, her story, um, she ended up dying of her injuries. And literally, she lived and died and nobody took notice of her death, even though she reported it to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So actually, I think we can play a clip of this tape. So this is a woman named Leslie Iron Road, and her, she's, she died, and her friend, Rhea Archambault, was saying that, that, that Leslie had told her what happened, and she went to visit her in the hospital, and she said, I know who did this to me. It's these four men. There are, these are their names. They live over here. This is what happened to me. And she said all that to the Bureau of Indian Affairs officer who was in the hotel, the hospital room with her. And Rhea Archambault, her friend, was right there while this report was being taken. So we'll play this clip and then we'll, we'll move it along and sure, come that's, back that's, to the conversation. Turn the lights on. I can't see. But the lights were on. She said, Rhea was raped and she was just squeezing my hand. Archambault called the Bureau of Indian Affairs Police, a small department in charge of all law enforcement on the reservation. A few days later, an officer arrived in the hospital room. Archambault says Leslie scratched out a statement on a tablet laid across her stomach, and the officer took notes. She told how they raped her, beat her up, and then they raped her again. They beat her up again, and just, like, we even let her out of the house. Archambault says Leslie told the officer that the men locked her in a bathroom and said they were coming back. Leslie said she swallowed pills for diabetes she found in the cabinet, hoping if she was unconscious they would leave her alone. The next morning, someone found her on the bathroom floor and called an ambulance. I seen what she said and I heard what she said. She named all the people that were there, the ones that were hitting her, the ones that were fighting her. She named everybody. What more else? A week later, after falling into a coma, Leslie was dead. And so was the investigation. None of the authorities who could have investigated what happened to Leslie Iron Road did. Not the Bureau of Indian Affairs, not the FBI, not anybody. People who know the men who likely attacked her say they were never even questioned.
Leslie Ironroad's case is not the only one. I spoke with at least a dozen people here, rape counselors, doctors, tribal leaders, and victims, people who were either assaulted or know women who were, in cases where no charges were filed. It's a pattern that repeats itself on Native American land across the country. On Standing Rock, there's one person in charge of law enforcement, Gerald White. I consider any sexual assault a serious problem, I mean, and we don't take them lightly. White is the chief of the Bureau of Indian Affairs Police Department. It was one of his officers who was dispatched to Leslie Iron Road's hospital room. Every sexual assault that's reported to us, we investigate to the fullest. So what about Leslie Iron Road? I looked back and there was nothing that I could substantiate. I'm sure she passed away, but her being as a, involved as a victim of a sexual assault, I couldn't find anything to support that happened here. A person doesn't report, then how can we investigate it if we don't know about it? Um, <laughs> right after that, it's, I said to him that, uh, that there was a report and that the, she did report that crime. And there's this long pause, which is sort of this like nice moment in radio, um, that he sort of stalls because he knows that he's in a bind right there. And he's like, well, I'll go back and look at it. And so eventually they did find um, they never found a report because the officer never filed one, but they did reopen the case into Leslie Iron Road's death. Well, thank you. Um, I think we'll move now to Betty Montgomery, delivered courtesy of, of our wonderful transportation infrastructure from LaGuardia Airport. Um, By I th Harrisonburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, so sorry. Um, <laughs> but I think also uh, for Kate, I think we're going to need to forego further clips. We'll put the clips up on the website uh, with the video, but I think just in the interest of time, I'll ask our remaining speakers if we can pass on the clips this time. I'm sorry about that because it's all. If, um, I can do mine with the clip and in five minutes because okay, I'm a radio a person. All right, if you only get, only because I chose something to. I'm not going to tell my whole story. I chose you, something uh, to. Then I'll, 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 I'll leave the choice to you. Okay. Um, but the, do you want to go? The, the charge. Can sure, sure. And I'll just say to Ben, since he wasn't here before, that the charge is to think back on your your Dart Award story. Talk a little bit about the particular challenge you faced and one thing that you carried away that's changed your reporting. Okay. Yeah, piece of cake. So quick overview. Two, uh, <laughs> two, two, 2000, October of 2008, these five old men who'd met each other online uh, and had all been wards of uh, the, the state of Florida's oldest, longest running reform school, opened in 1900. They, they found each other and they convinced the state to let them have a press conference on the campus of the Florida School for Boys. And the things they said were shocking. Uh, they had been beaten bloody by a one-armed man in a low-slung cinder block building that smelled like piss and uh, sweat. And um, uh, some of them had been raped and, uh, and their classmates had disappeared. Uh, this was covered, fortunately, by a, an Associated Press reporter who was there, the only, the only reporter that was present. And it ran on the wires the next day. And, and what these uh, men were saying was uh, so shocking that I ran over to my editor's desk, and um, I, when I get excited, I, I, I do this. I pinch my, my dog tooth. And, uh, and she says, yeah, go. And um, because my question was very primary, is this the truth? Are these guys telling the truth? As that news spread, uh, hundreds more uh, victims of the Florida School for Boys in the 1950s and 1960s started coming forward and approaching um, uh, this group, this small organization of men that, that had formed. Um, and we uh, very quickly got in touch with them and said, anybody who calls you, please direct them to us because we want to get to the bottom of this. We also want to see if there's any of uh, the abusers alive, anybody who can be held to account. And beyond that, can we hold the system to account? And beyond that, this school is still open? What's going on there now? And beyond that, there's a cemetery in the woods with 31 unmarked graves who's buried there. And beyond that, are there more? And so fast forward five years, um, there's a team of uh, anthropologists from the University of South Florida who have um, done forensic anthropology work, and they've exhumed a total of 55 bodies from unmarked graves uh, on that campus. Uh, it's, a, it's a shocking thing. Uh, it's a nightmare. And there are now 500 men, uh, like these guys on the board who have, this, this gentleman here is dead actually, but who have joined um, a lawsuit against the state of Florida trying to say that you have ruined our lives. You've wrecked our lives. And I think that's where um, sort of the, the, um, the things uh, DART stands for came into play with us because we didn't want to treat these men 
uh, uh, you know, in any sort of sentimental fashion. What we wanted to do is um, give them for the first time ever the chance to say what happened to them and to tell the truth and, uh, and possibly to carry that message, uh, the message of how, how their lives were shaped by this childhood trauma um, to uh, their neighbors and to the rest of the citizens of Florida who have overlooked uh, what happened to these guys for years and years and years. Um, so the, the many, many challenges in that, um, including fighting a state that was trying to, uh, uh, which has great sunshine, sunshine laws, but was trying to fight us uh, at every turn, uh, fight us from getting access to the boys who are still housed there in 2011, um, who uh, told us that uh, they were still being abused, their noses were still being broken, their arms were still being broken, they're still, still being kept for long periods of time in solitary confinement. Um, uh, they were being, uh, yeah, provided access to a, a phone to call the abuse hotline, but they had to make the call in front of the person who had abused them, things like that. Um, so we exposed this in a series of stories that wound up, uh, I mean, to the, I'm still writing about it. It's um, a, at least a, a book-length body of work at this point. Um, uh, and I could, I could choose any kind of uh, a nugget in this whole adventure uh, to, to pull the lesson I learned, what's changed me as a journalist. But I think the most important thing is um, I've never before thrown myself into a project like this. And, and it has um, uh, personally some like interesting and, and maybe even like severe effects. I mean, I drink way more than I should. Uh, I think that's a direct result of like carrying home the pain that these guys have bore for so long, um, just just in um, inside myself. Uh, the the lesson though is uh, I got an I got an email from a, a former uh, editor at the Tampa Bay Times, formerly the St. Pete Times, about two maybe three years ago, uh, in the middle of all this, before before anybody got interested in the in the dead boys and started digging out there, uh, while we were still trying to ring the bell saying. Somebody needs to figure this out. The state investigation is cursory and does not answer any of our questions about this. Who are these boys? How many are out there? So before any of that started, uh, this, this former editor of the Times emailed. This made me a little uncomfortable at first, but he said, I'm glad to see the Times is still crusading. And that word uh, is sort of loaded in journalism, I think. But I've come to embrace that. Uh, if you're crusading on, on, on the side of, of social justice and on the side of good, um, I'm not so sure that's not what journalism is meant to be. I, I guarantee you uh, Joseph Pulitzer would endorse that, endorse that idea. Um, so uh, so that, that's the lesson. It, it took me from, you know, uh, there, there are pitfalls in that obviously, but it took me from this sort of passive, um, super objective journalist to a journalist who, um, who wants to expose wrongdoing uh, desperately and wants to uh, uh, bring people to account and, and wants to get uh, dramatically at, at the truth and, and to tell that truth. Okay. So, Thank you. And actually, is that five? That is five. <laughs> that is great. One of the interesting things about trauma as a subject that we as journalists have learned from, from clinicians, like some folks who are here today, is that severe trauma and cruelty does sometimes demand action and crusading. And, and part of the definition is of acts that move us from passivity to action in the face of, of horror. That's a very important lesson. Jeb, you were, I think, the first or second art award winner to take all of these different challenges and lessons and apply them to a subject outside the US. Huh. Talk yeah. a little bit yeah. about your work. Um, and I think I can forego the clip. I can figure out a way to do this, um, <laughs> just because. Uh, uh, so my, I'll just really briefly describe the project, and then I just want to talk about something more subtle, which is why the craft actually really matters for the responsible coverage of trauma. Um, so I, I was looking at rape and war. I had met some women in a, in a refugee camp in Chad in 2007 who'd been you know, captured, enslaved, raped for various amounts of time. It, it just the, the sitting with them, hearing their stories, I never actually did anything with the material because I didn't have time to really follow through. and and get it right, but that, that afternoon with those people just stuck with me. So 
I set about doing something about rape in war, not so much the phenomenon, which was well documented and is extreme in scale and violence in many conflicts, but to find out in really intense places what the response was. So in Congo, I looked at kind of the med immediate medical response and the humanitarian aid response. In Rwanda, 14 years after the genocide, I looked at kind of the societal response. How are the kids born of these rapes? Uh, being treated, and also the kind of legal angle of where the prosecution's happening, in the real courts, in the Gachacha courts, um, and then what was the UN Security Council doing about it, which was timely, because 2008 was when it, it started to kind of be elevated as an issue. Um, so that was the whole ball of wax. When I got to Congo, and your thing about trust and logistics rings true there, um, Laura, just the, the, the work that needed to, ha to get into that. I was profiling Dr. Dennis McQuege, who's a pelvic surgeon who runs a hospital in Bukavu where basically these women's bodies are repaired. Um, and what I wasn't prepared for was that I was going to be meeting survivors who were kids. Just in my naivete, in my denial, whatever, I got there prepared to roll tape and talk to lots of people and, and there were kids. And, um, so a whole raft of ethical issues, not a lot of time to cope with them. I ended up gathering tape in the best way I could. But, but what I wanted to, and what the clip was about really was, was the only way really to deal with that material was to incorporate the misgivings, the dilemmas in, in the actual writing. And I did it unwittingly, I think, in the process with my editor. At each question she had, I sort of had to insert that. And um, it was Gina Moore, who many of you know, who's done great work for DART and great journalism. Um, she wrote a piece about covering rape in the Columbia Journalism Review. And she basically pointed out that I had done this, that I had been a kind of reliable narrator because of this kind of contract with the reader or the listener, where you give enough transparency to acknowledge that you're in this territory that is just not okay in any way, that the crimes aren't okay and the what you have to do to report on the crimes. There's sort of really potentially, you know, just lots of pitfalls. And so um, I carry that with me. And the fact that the DART Center exists is sort of just the very fact of it existing and caring about this stuff. When you go out to do a story, it's like, am I doing this well? Am I doing this right? Am I taking these considerations into account? So I think both the story and my contact with the DART Center have kind of given me that. And I, I take it as a real responsibility. So, mm -hmm. And you. I like talking to people about how we do it better. So. Well, thank you. Totally. Habib, you, you, awesome. you are, with what happened at Dos Aris, you were uh, having one foot in the U.S., one foot in Latin America, one foot in the present day, one foot 30 years ago. Very complicated issues there. Yeah. My biggest fear was nobody's going to pay attention. Um, and, you know, people are Often when I think stories are successful, people say, oh, I, I had a feeling this was going to be great. I had, I had none of that. I, I was like, when it was even air, like, when, you know, it was 8 o'clock I, I, on Friday night when it ran um, on This American Life, and I did not want to listen to the radio because I was like, this, uh, people are going to eat it. I, I didn't know what, I was like, I had lived this story for, I think, eight months straight. Um, the last month of it, it was, um, I think, you know, including weekends, was three till 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, my producer, Brian Reed, and I would be working on this, and then next morning, back at it at 7 a.m. And so I had no reality check of how this would be received. And what you know, just to briefly talk about the story, it's, um, it, it starts with um, a, a guy named Oscar who lives in Boston. He gets a call um, that he is a survivor of a massacre in Dos Eras, and these prosecutors are looking for him. Um, and he's just like, no, I'm not. You know, he, what he knows about his life is he's the son of a lieutenant who was in the Guatemalan military, and uh, you know, uh, he considers him a hero, and he looks up to him. Um, he died shortly after. Yeah, you know, he died about three, four years um, when when Oscar was three or four years old. He doesn't remember. It's vague memories of it. He sees photos of himself with him. So he, this is this guy is his hero. Um, well, after. A couple of tries, the prosecutors um, convince Oscar to um, allow him to do, take a DNA test. They come here from Guatemala to do a DNA test, and they learn, voila, he is this missing survivor from this massacre that happened over 30 years ago in Guatemala, and his dad is not who he thought he was. And also, moreover, his real dad is actually alive. His name is Strancolino, and he's this alcoholic who 
um, who just, on, on the day of the massacre, the military came. Um, he was, Tancalino was out of town, um, so his real dad. He was out of town. He comes back, his entire family is gone. Um, they had, the military came in, they raped women, they dug a massive grave and started killing and putting in the entire village, over 200 people, including babies, um, in this mass grave. And, and Oscar's family was part of this. Um, for some weird reason, this, this lieutenant takes Oscar with him um, and raises him as his own son. Um, there were a lot of challenges, I think, um, journalistically and sort of, um, it, first was that I don't speak Spanish. That's, that was a big challenge, I would say. Um, <laughs> And you know, one, one of the things we had to do was really apply the same rigorous standards you would have on, on doing an investigation. Um, we hired an external fact checker to make sure that we had translated all the material. And so the story is told through first person accounts um, of people who were there and, and who were, had been investigating this for 30 years. Um, but we wanted to make sure we didn't misinterpreted anything and, and all that. And so the, the fact-checking process of this story was, was I thought, um, fantastic and, and, and sort of challenging, but it was great. Um, the biggest challenge for me personally was we finally got access to this guy, two men who were at the massacre, who, who took part in it. So as a journalist, most of the time, you're just trying to get access. But um, so this was a team of reporters, it was four reporters in total, including myself and my producer, Brian Reed. And, we designated me to be the person who was going to interview these two men who had committed these mass, you know, these who, who took part in this massacre. There's no nice way to say this. They were in a witness protection program in a third safe country where we were allowed to to talk to them, and that was challenging because, you know, they had agreed to talk to you, so you kind of, it's not sympathy. It's 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 you need to to sort of dig through for a different part of of journalism that I think we, I didn't learn in J school. Like, how do you interview mass murderers um, in a hotel room for 12 hours straight? I, I didn't, I, I, that was really, really challenging. Um, and also, it was different kind of, I mean, they weren't, it wasn't like I was trying to get it out of them whether they did it or not. They came into the room and they said, we took part in this. So what do you do for the next 12 hours? Um, <laughs> so th that was, for me, that was one of the most challenging things to sort of do, but it was also an important part of the story. So what I, what I, and I have no idea if this is the right way to do it, but what I really tried to do was sort of remove myself from like the disgust, the, the emotion, and, and not to say you don't ask them the accountability questions, that's part of your job, but also to ask them what, what the listener would wanna know. You know, bring, take, take us to that moment and what were you thinking? Um, and, I, and I think I, we owed that to the listener to sort of to ask them those questions. So I think you, at that moment, you really, the best way to conduct that interview is to be a sit-in for the, for the listener and, and to be honest and, and say, well, this is, you know, somebody listening to this is really not gonna have any sympathy for you. What do you wanna say to that person? And at that moment, this guy who had like killed tons of people just started bawling and started crying. And he said, I just want forgiveness. I'm so sorry for what I did. And I wasn't ready for that. Um, so that was, that was a challenging. Right. Process. Um, we have well, time for one or two questions, and there's a lot kind of going on here. We have perpetration and victimization. We have storytelling and interviewing, crusading and witnessing. Um, someone, come up to the microphone and ask something in the <laughs> minutes there are left uh, of these extraordinary <laughs> journals. If not, I'm going to have to do it. Uh, but yeah, go ahead. Just go up to the mic since we're recording this for, for okay posterity. Well, the microphone needs it's for the video. So, uh, and no, people can't hear you anyway. <laughs> Very powerful presentation, um, and really interesting and provocative. My question is one I ask myself, which is when you ask people to go into, into gritty detail, because of course it's the details that tell the story, when you ask them to really relive it, um, how do you avoid re-traumatizing them? And I guess that's, that's yeah. the question. And, and that's a question for pretty much any of you at this table have had to wrestle with. Um, there's interesting science on this, which is on the Dart Center website, www.dartcenter.org. Um, <laughs> but as a matter of, how have any of you thought about it? Anyone want to hold up your hand there? Laura? Um, 
I think you, you I think you, it's, it's, it depends on who your who the interviewee is, because I've been in situations where you just know that you can't do the interview. Mm -hmm. Like you're two sent, you're two questions in, and you're like, this we can't do mm -hmm. this. And then you come across other people who um, want to tell their story, and, and then it just depends on how you listen to it, mm -hmm. you know, and the and. It seems to me that, especially for people who are telling their story for the first time, you have to check every ounce of judgment at the door. Because if that's the first person that they're saying it to, your response is gonna matter forever. And um, you just have to make sure that you're handling that mm -hmm. as best as you possibly can. Because you don't, and you don't wanna, read it, you don't want them thinking that they're poor stricken victims either because they're now at a point where they want to tell their story. So there is some strength, there's some fire there that's coming back and you can't risk, you just can't risk screwing with their minds. It's, just, it's really hard. But for the people that you're asking a question of and they're answering you to be polite, mm, mm -mm. those aren't your people for the story. That's okay. how I feel. One more thought is Rob. Yeah. I usually start my interview by telling the person I'm, in, I'm interviewing I'm gonna take the lead from them. If I start to ask a question that you're in any way uncomfortable answering, tell me and we'll go someplace else. I'll, I always, always take the lead from who I'm interviewing. And I'll just add real quick, I think it always begins with a heartfelt, I'm sorry, and then starting to listen. Um, and I'll, I will just add to that. Um, one of the nice things about this work with the DART Center and the DART Awards is that we are often in dialogue with clinicians and other kinds of scientists. Um, one of them is Alana Newman, who is here, and one of the things that I have learned from her as a journalist is there's a difference between distress and re-traumatization. Um, and we do sometimes kind of need to take a breath and say, well, just because someone's upset doesn't mean we're actually re-traumatizing them. We can forgive ourselves as journalists a little bit in that way. Um, this is uh, this conversation could go on for a really long time, but it can't. Um, though it can go on informally uh, during the reception later on. Let's take. Let's first of all thank this panel. Thank Joe and Bob and Laura and Jeff and Susan and Ben. Um, let's take a five-minute break and change panels for the judges. While we do that, a grab some coffee or whatever. Uh, B, there are a lot of friends of the DART Center in this symposium audience. There are two people I want to very specially acknowledge, though. Um, my friends uh, Rian Kuntari and uh, Yehia Ghanem are both journalists in exile. Uh, Rian from Indonesia, uh, Yehia from Egypt, both of them journalists of courage and integrity and compassion who have found sanctuary here from enormous threat and legal prosecution and other things. I just want to welcome you guys in particular, you live this. Anyway, judges, up. Journalists, out. <laughs> <laughs>